Well, Bugs, we're playing Sydney in Sydney this Friday night, and I must say I'm very glad that we're playing in the west rather than the east because it's quite a dangerous place to go and find yourself nowadays in the east part of Sydney. There's car crashes galore, bust-ups on the street. You wouldn't want to get stuck between those two heavyweights that I had to fight in at the front of the house this morning, would you? Talking to two heavyweights, welcome, Bards. Mr. Wedlock, welcome back. Oh, jeez, oh, you stitched us up again. Pathetic. <laughs> Bring the action. All right, the score was Hawthorne 27 13, 175 to St Kilda, 4 goals, 6 30. Goal kickers. All right, Gunston 4, Roughhead 4, Schoenmakers 4, Bruce 4, Rioli 2, Burgoyne 2, Hale 2, Piopolo 2, and Singles 2, Hartung, Hill and Lewis. Every week, I think, except for the John game, that we've had more than 10. Excellent work. So let's get stuck into the Bardslow medalists. And before you go, the votes were looking at the end of last round. Mitch on 13, which is about where it's going to stop for a long while. Bruce on 11, and Rioli on 10. So, Bards. All right, I've given five votes to Sean Burgoyne for an excellent game. I agree with the judges who gave him best on ground. Four to Gibson. Great game down back. I'm not forgetting the defenders. Look, he pretty much would rewrite out of the game before on any opportunities that he did have, which weren't much. Three to Ruff had a return of form, albeit against a struggling side, but he was good. Two to Bruce, their best. And I've given one vote to the first game wonder kid, Billy Hartung. All right, so that means that Bruce and Mitchell are equal on 13. Adam, how did you see this guy? I saw it virtually the same way everybody else saw it as, as a complete and utter mismatch, and then I saw the second half of the game through rather heavy rain and team with a high level of skill against a team with kids that struggled to get to grips with the, the conditions. There was very little takeout from the game other than the, the two bad injuries that we copped in, during the afternoon. No good can come of a game that's played in such a bad temperature, in the wet and against such poor opposition. Yeah, well, having said that, the percentage boost is helpful. You know, it made a big difference on the ladder. That might come in handy at the end of the year, but yeah, other than that, and probably just getting a, a good game for the first game of Hartung and the return a shoey, low pressure situations, good for them to get a run under their belt. But yeah, look, I think the uh, weather, once it gets slippery, the pressure we're applying, if you can't be clean with your hands, you're going to be in trouble. And that was St Kilda's problem. They fumbled with in the weather, as most teams tend to do, and we're all over them from that point. And then the reverse was, I thought, we were pretty good with the ball in the wet. So yeah, it was a massacre of large proportions. I was surprised that we played so many kids in the end because we also threw Litherland in towards the end there as well well there's much other options to be honest Stratton obviously not right Saul is not ready to come back yet so anyone that's going to fill their spots are probably going to be kids there's not a lot of old blokes on the sidelines so we've had five debutantes and there might be a couple more by the end of the year as well alright well there's not much more to say about this game is there really so do we want to move on to a blast bar on blast free this week Grant Nothing to say. So I'm going to start asking some questions. questions, Talking about winning by 145 points. Adam, what do you think of John Ralph's suggestion that if you beat a team by over 100 points, you should get a bonus point? Leave the effing game alone. Thank you. What is he going on about? Why change the game? He thinks that teams that are winning by 90 points don't want to win by 100? That's not an incentive to increase scoring, I'm sorry, but it's just not. 
Isn't that the purpose of the percentage? Exactly. There's, yeah. been, there's already a benefit in place. So, yeah, look, it's not going to help. I understand that scoring's lower, but that sort of thing's just not going to make a difference. You know, they use it in rugby union. You get a bonus point for scoring tries because they're trying to encourage teams to take a little bit of risk and go for the try rather than take the easy penalty goal or whatever. But in our game, it wouldn't work and we don't need to mess with it. I think half the problem is the amount of focus that we've got on games now with, you know, 24-hour footy. Everyone sees all these games. In the past, the poor games weren't on TV. No one saw them, so no one really paid much attention. But now, yeah, they're all on display. You know, Channel 7 this week will be wrapped. They've got St Kilda and Carlton on Monday night. John Ralph's forgotten about the, the good old days of football out at the Western Oval in Victoria Park on absolute mud heaps where the, there were no skills and the games were just crap. Leave the game alone. The coaches will evolve the game without any help from the AFL or the bogus rules committee. And there was another word I wanted to use there. Coaches are smart enough these days to evolve game plans to combat whatever other coaches put up against them. That's correct. We don't have the fighting like we did in the early 2000s, do we, in, in that form? Because they just found a way around it. So just let the game keep moving along. All right. Well, I'm going to move you on a few other questions. Last week, uh, the guys came in a bit late after we recorded. So let's go through a few right here, Adam. Mr. Hogendike came back and said, does Adam think he's a better driver than Buddy? Well, I've driven with Adam, so I'd suggest yes. I can't recall ever smashing into four park cars. <laughs> All right. Port Adelaide, genuine quality list or early bolter this season? Genuine quality list, good side. Yeah, and very fit too. Good coach, and he's made a hell of a difference there. Yeah, genuine, a little bit of experience might pull him back a little bit towards the end of the year. It remind me a lot of Hawthorne in 08, to be honest. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually expecting a Hawthorne Port Adelaide grand final. All right, well, who will be the side's top scorer in 2014, given the even spread of scoring options we now have? And that's interesting because isn't it in the top 10 Bruce, Gunston, and Ruffy? Yeah, I still like Gunston only because his conversion ratio is a lot higher, so uh, he's going to be able to get his goals from less shots than the other couple. Yeah, I think Ruffy might get there in the end. I think what's probably helped Gunston a bit, Lake's injury, as it forces Schoenmakers into the back half. I think if he was playing forward a bit, Gunston might have been used up the ground a bit more, but he'll probably be closer to the goal now with Shuey going back, so that'll help him. Well, last of Mr. Hogan Dyke's sensible questions, and there are no silly ones today, apart from that first one about driving, I suppose. Based on current performance, because this season marks Cyril Rioli's elevation into one of the true elites of the game. Sorry, what was the question? Is Cyril good? Not according to Matthew Lloyd, but I think he's pretty good. Ask David Hale, I think he's still trying to get the ball off his chest. (laughs) That was one of the best kicks I've ever seen in AFL football. And that goal Cyril kicked as well, where it started in the centre bounce and he chased the ball, harassed, got it off, knocked it on, ran past three blokes like they were standing still, over the top, got it back and then just slotted it calmly on the left. Uh, Magnificent goal that was. And yeah, he sort of showed it again, a little five to ten minute burst there in the third, just how good he is. Now, if Mr. Hogan don't won't ask the silly questions, I'll ask a silly question. Adam, tell me why we pay a premium for a Kennedy club when we get rained on. <laughs> You can't help that. I love the seats we have. I just suppose the club hiking us upwards of 20% this season and providing almost exactly the same service. Can't they just extend that roof out a bit or something? It's ridiculous. You look up and the roof's covering and you're still getting wet. (laughs) Although you didn't get wet because you found some other poor person's seat at the back and grabbed that. I didn't. I was forced to come down and sit with you after Mrs. Howe sent me down. Mrs. Howe's wanted her seat, so you got booted down to me in the rush. I didn't want to be there, I don't think. I I just refused to not sit in my seat because I paid for it. (laughs) I did commit an Adam and left early. What does that mean? Well, I left early. I never leave early. You committed an Adam. Well, you leave early. What is that? 
Yeah. When do I leave early? Did you leave early when we were done last year? We didn't get beat last year. Must have been before. I'll admit that I left at half time once, though. When we, 2009, when the goal was still half time against the Western Bulldogs. Oh, there you go. I walked out. I wasn't paying to sit there and watch that crap. Well, I figured that 131 points up leaving early wasn't such a bad idea. Maybe you should leave all this for discussion next week, given we've got the bye. And let's talk about some of the etiquette of football when we can answer Kelly Schultz's question as well about devotion to membership and devotion of the spouse and devotion of staying till the end of the game, even if you're getting thumped by 100 points. What do you reckon? All right, what other questions we got here? The goal says, should the AFL investigate changing the rule around holding the ball? Leave the effing game alone. I can't agree more. It's, the rule's fine. Interpretations are up and about, depending on what the umpire's up to, but there's no need to change the actual rule. All right, well, the goal asked another one today, and he said, name four players from other clubs that we should have a quiet discussion with. Uh, they could fit in the always Hawthorne mould to hold down the elusive centre-half back roll. Four players. I think we'll be talking to uh, James Frawley. I would be surprised if we aren't having another look at Michael Jamison, although he's probably more of a fullback. I don't know where somebody like Alex Rance is at with his contract with Richmond. And as for the other one, I couldn't think of a fourth one, but if we've got plenty of pocket money, forget about going for a David Mundy. Aim a little higher and have a quiet chat to Nathan Fife. That would be handy. The other one I'd look at is, and I've got no idea what his contract terms are, but Rory Thompson at the Gold Coast. Oh, he's a good footballer. Looks like being a very good footballer. and He may be a Jack Gunson sort of situation where you can pry him away they can't keep all of them I don't think they'd want him to go under any circumstances but we may be in a position where we can offer big money and price on their heads and all that sort of situation so he'd be one working out what he's up to well I'll throw a fourth one in what about Jake Carlisle Yeah, potentially. He's a good footballer, but I like Kale Hooker better. I think I prefer Carlisle as a footballer, but I've just got visions of Kyle Hooker trying to chase Buddy down that wing. Carlisle's an interesting one because by all reports, he, he wants to play back and Top Bowen wants him playing forward, but I guess you've got to remember that Hurdy will be back at the end of the year and he might have different plans for him. So getting a bloke from Essen, an interesting idea. Well, it's been done before, Bards, hasn't it? With the recruitment of Salmon. Paul Salmon, I thought you were going to say Barry Young. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and Danny Jacobs, yep. We ended up with Todd Ridley at some stage. I don't know. It was, we went through some hacks at one stage, yeah. But we gave them Barnard. There's been a, probably been a few over the years, actually. And look, the last question, Aaron asked a question, which was, should Hawthorne be drafting players from America like other clubs in Sydney, Port and St Kilda? No. No, and I think, you know, we've got a couple of project players out of New Zealand that look like good prospects. We don't have any issues with the way we recruit footballers. The recruiting teams do an excellent job, and New Zealand makes a lot more sense. That, you know, at least coming from a rugby type background, there's a little bit more, you know, use of the, the same shape ball and stuff. And players out of America, I think it'll be a while before any of them are actually any good. Yeah, for every Mike Pike, there'll be a hundred guys that don't make it. There's a few blokes around there that um, just don't understand the game properly, and it's so instinctive. You need to understand this game to, to be any good. If you just an athlete, uh, you definitely no guarantee to make it. Well, gentlemen, that was question time, and all our members keep sending in those questions. I think we enjoy the banter from them. Now, nearest to the pin. Four. And I don't know how he does it, and I'd suggest we need to investigate this man's handicap, but Alan Forsyth, closest again, but still a mile off. To be honest, if I knew the size is selected when we recorded the show last week, I might have gone a bit higher than what I did. But we might have not realised how good the skills were really going to be in the wet, would we? So, you know, balance. True, no, he's done well.
Well, let's talk about Friday night's game. It is luckily, as I say, in the West. What was formerly an Olympic stadium, but not, not as good as the MCG, of course. Friday night, 9th of May, Sydney Swans, ANZ Stadium. It's a away game, starts at 7.50. How are we going to go? You tell me. Buddy, you going to play? Kaiko reckons he's more likely not to. Sure. The worst around the place is that he won't play. Yeah, they're, they're obviously not as good a side with him out. I mean, if he plays, I'd imagine Gibson it would go to him to start with. He used to do a pretty good job on him when he's running around at north, so he, he'll probably be the option. Tippett is definitely back, so we'll need to keep someone tall for him. I imagine Shoemakers would be picking him up. The rest will be up to, I guess, whoever comes in. Take Brian's spot. We'll see what happens there. But look, they're not the side they were. They, they've seemed to have slowed down through the midfield a bit, and we've probably had a pace in that area, so... So I'd expect us to be able to beat them. North beat them up there fairly comfortably. They're not as good a side at ANZ as what they are at SCG either. So I'll be backing us in. Billy Hartung, how good was he for a run off the halfback line? Very low pressure situation, but he, he was very composed with the ball. I think he had one shock and turnover, but other than that, he used it really well. Took players on. They told him to, to use his run, and he did, and he'll go again, as will Mitch Allahan, I'd imagine. Little and stay in, maybe? Depends what they want to do there. I guess there's an option of Cheney coming back to pick up a tour as well. So it'll be interesting to see how they swing things around. Langford hopefully will be back. I'd imagine he'd probably go to Kennedy or Hanbury. So yeah, it's going to be a few interesting matchups. All right. Well, a margin. Bars. Four. I'll go with uh, 29 points. Adam? Four. 17 points for me. And your thoughts on the game? Thoughts on the game, I think Franklin being out is obviously a big thing, but that's obviously mitigated by the fact that we go in without Lake, who was the obvious matchup, or potentially Lake would have gone to Tippett and Gibson to Franklin, but either way, it leaves us one short at the back, and, and Mitchell obviously being out. So I think on the balance, our outs are probably just as big, if not bigger. The Swans don't play that ground very well traditionally, and I think they, as Bard said, they're not lightning quick through the midfield. And if we can hold our own at the stoppages and get the ball outside, I think we We've got enough uh, outside pace and guys that use the ball really well to put a score on the board that Sydney won't be able to match. I just think it's amazing that we're talking about our outside pace where, you know, 12 months or two years ago, everyone said we were so slow. And the addition of, obviously, hard tongue last week, but Hill and Smith into that side has just made a a huge difference. Yeah. All right. Now, my margin's going to be 27 points. And before we end the show with the normal uh, ending, I'm going to just remind everyone of a very important occasion this weekend for the AFL. And while it's a couple of teams that are sort of at the bottom of the ladder, it's worth recognising, which is the Melbourne versus the Western Bulldogs game on Saturday night, 7.40. It's the pink game. So those people who are going along, well done. And for other people, just remember what the cause is for. So uh, on that note, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.